Hi everyone, welcome back to another magic video. Today we're going to be looking at my run through the Pioneer Challenge with, of course, mine and Allie's favorite deck, Gruel Smash. This is not a popular meta Pioneer deck, so I was trying to get top 32 so we could get this deck in the deck dump. However, I only ended up going three and four, got top 36, so we're just gonna have to try again. Maybe next Sunday. Important things to know about this list, we are running all eight one drops that can get bigger, Pelt Collector being the best one, because it grows on death, whereas something like Experiment One does not. Following that up, we have the great cheesy Burning Tree Emissary allow us to get Double creatures on turn two, hoping to follow up with something like Zerta Goblin, Gallia with Haste. Turn three, ideally, Gruel Spellbreaker. And then eight finishers up here with Questing Beast and Ember Cleave. We like running all four cleaves, so that really informs the rest of the deck to make our creatures want to go tall as opposed to going wide. So that's why we do stuff like Pelt Collector, Experiment One, because they just hold the cleave so much better than something like Land of War Elves. Fun of Clothis, Bone Crusher for great interaction. And the sideboard has kind of been stable for the last few months against Control. We have these kind of cards. We got Value, we got Uncounterable, we got Planeswalker, all very good. I put these Rending Volleys in against Winota. They also hit some cards in Phoenix. Winota's meta share has gone down, so I should probably think about taking one of these out. Braid is great against Creature decks. It's great against Jund. This is the tech against Ascendancy and against even Phoenix. Pretty interesting. I might take this out for like that Cemetery Gatekeeper that if I exile an instant, then it would ping them for two every time and then Ferocidon is just always a strong card it's hard to board in because we're pretty high on the three drop slot but sometimes that anti-life gain is pretty real anyway I love this deck it's really fun get to run probably the best creature land with Den of the Bugbear even though we're a little bit more green than we are red and it's just fun to play and smash people and I think we have some interesting games and situations that you'll enjoy seeing all right, welcome to the uh, title match. First one I want to show. This first game is just a great example of what this Gruel deck can do, especially when you win the die roll. Let's take a look. So even with Den of the Bugbear, if we have enough untapped green, we can run out something like a Pelt Collector. Still be able to hit green on turn one, green red on turn two. You can just see that perfect curve. Burning Tree Emissary into a haste creature. Swinging for four, six power on board. On turn two. And after fitting up a hasted Gruel Spellbreaker, swinging for quite a bit more. Opponents at six before they even untap on turn three. And that's just gonna do it. And that's when we go to sideboarding, of course. I don't have a great idea about what the opponent's playing, so I don't make many sideboard changes here. I do know that my opponent is probably playing some sort of three or four color deck. They don't have a companion. So I probably just cut a cleave or so, especially on the draw, and assume that they'll have some amount of removal. So bring in a more grindy threat, like Ranger class. All right, it's time for game two of that match. This time we do not get to be on the play. We're seeing an opening hand that's a little bit awkward. This is the type of thing that can happen if you get ambitious with your mana base. These rootbound crags, we only have 12 basic types in our deck which allegedly means you can only count them as about three quarters of an untapped 
land per copy. And also you can never count them as untapped on turn one. Let's see if I keep this hand. It's like somewhat reasonable on the draw, but of course we can do better. All right, looks like I want him to play. This time we're seeing a creature land off of our opponent. Into another creature land by our opponent. Double striker. I guess it's worth commenting that we just ripped the forest off the top to perfectly be able to curve out and not commit our pathways. It's extremely good. And we drew a two drop. Wow, what a good <laughs> what a good set of draws for this game. Once again, hitting our opponent for four on turn two. We have the board wipe. Multicolor mana, interplanar beacon. At this point, should know things are getting a little bit strange. But I'm just gonna keep swinging in because that's what our deck does. And this is where we get to see our opponent's true colors with Fires of Invention. It's just that mana engine used to be popular and standard, which means that now they can follow up with another spell without paying its mana cost. Gaining some life, three mana Gideon. Pretty powerful Planeswalker, it can be a four four, it can prevent you from losing the game, and it can start locking down an opponent's creature. Which is what they do here on my Girl Spellbreaker. Now, here's why I think this game is so interesting. Because of the way my cards interact against the opponent here. So as you can see, we're going to run out Questing Beast, which I can't remember all the text on. Very importantly, it will allow us to do combat damage to our opponent's face to their Planeswalker. So Questing Beast can just go right ahead and it's gonna take out their Gideon. But even more importantly than that, it says damage that would be dealt by creatures you control can't be prevented. And the way this Gideon is worded, it definitely says prevent all damage, target permanent when deal. So my opponent probably thought they were reasonably safe when they passed the turn back that they weren't gonna take that much damage. They probably still have a Gideon when the turn comes back to them. But instead, all my creatures are online. I have dealt eight damage to their face. Their Planeswalker is gone. It's looking really good for me just because of that questing beast interaction on this one turn. Now, of course, it's not always that simple. Opponent gets to follow up with this board wipe. And of course, they have Fires of Invention. They can play another card. So they choose Gideon. And shock in a land. Very heads up play by them. And once again, I draw a Questing Beast. Well, opponent can't cast spells during my turn. Questing Beast is lethal against them, right? as long as we can also kill their Gideon. Now here's where the interesting and tough part comes in. Our opponent, in display of good deck building, Fires of Invention means they don't have to spend mana on their spells, which means that they can pass the turn back to me and hold up their creature lands. So even though it looks like I can just swing with Questing Beast for lethal, I would not be able to get through. Now, this Needle Spires can only become a 2-1 double strike. And another great line of text on Questing Beast, can't be blocked by creatures with power 2 or less. So we're in the clear, can't block us with Needle Spires if we go for Questing Beast. Now where the problem comes is this Wandering Fumeral. It'll become a 1-4. Couldn't block, but for free, they can just switch the power and toughness. So all they have to do is activate swap power and toughness, then go to blocks, they'll trade with Questing Beast. 
and all of a sudden my card that is so powerful against their Gideon and the interactions that it can put on the battlefield has just traded for their land. That's not really where I want to be because then my opponent's going to untap. They're still going to have a Gideon. They have another card in hand. They're going to draw for turn. It just didn't seem like the most good position that we could get into. So what can we do instead? I say, well, our opponent has access to these creature lands. Is there any way we can get them to tap out? Is there any way, probably not because they have fires of invention, is there any way that we can get this off the table? And so that's when I come up with this alternate line that I think is pretty interesting. Oh, it's also worth noting that Bone Crusher Giant's Stomp prevents damage from being prevented this turn as well so i'm sure there are some interesting lines with gideon plus and then bone crusher giant and getting damage through over here i go for the zerta goblin with haste now it's arguable where you might want to send this goblin i'm thinking even if gideon plus is next turn it would still die to a questing beast that's also assuming i'd be able to get in next turn and not somewhere down the line with questing beast i'm not sure where it's correct to send the zerta goblin here because they could still be gaining life of course too and i want their life total be to be under pressure even though i have to get rid of gideon before i can get the game over so i just end up sending it at them The reason here is, well, what are they going to do? Are they going to activate Wandering Fumeral and block without swapping power and toughness? It would just bounce. There's no point to do that. Are they going to swap and trade? That doesn't seem good. You know what seems really good? Using a 2-1 double strike land to eat this Zerta Goblin for free. That looks like a great deal. Also, this could never block Questing Beast anyway. So my opponent has their wits about them they're probably thinking oh wow this is great it's so great for me to activate needle spires it's probably too good to be true however sometimes you just want to make the play that seems like it would be good for you so as predicted they do go for the needle spires and before blocks i go ahead and stomp it with bone crusher giant which means that I'm able to bring them down to two and their land is gone, which importantly means they don't have the mana for Wandering Fumeral. Not only do they not have the five mana, because you need four mana besides the Fumeral to activate it, they don't have red, so they need an untapped red source if they want to be able to keep holding up a fumeral blocker. So if they don't draw land, they don't draw untapped red, they're in a lot of trouble. I was gonna say they can't use a shock land here to get untapped red, but I think you're probably able to pay the two life cost and go to zero if you have the Gideon emblem. Yeah, I think you may pay life that you have if you're at a positive life total. I think you can shock yourself down to zero and not lose the game. Anyway, how relevant is that? Because our opponent casts a Planeswalker and is gaining life anyway. Chandra, extremely powerful planeswalker and helps them take advantage of only drawing one card a turn but being able to cast two cards for free off fires because if you're exiling the top card of your library to draw an extra card you're going to be able to play them but it looks like they're going for mana here Okay, that's what happened. I was very confused at the time as well. I'm still not sure about this animate. 
It's like, what are they going to do? Swap and it would die? It's one more piece of lifelink. So they're going to lifelink for five up to eight. Whereas if you don't animate, could have drawn an extra card. Yeah, I'm not sure about this. I didn't really think about it at the time. So I was more sad about them lifelinking me. And here we are. Is it go time for questing beast yet? Honestly, the answer was probably yes. I feel like questing beast, swing at them, put the damage on Chandra is just the most powerful thing we can do. It does let them draw removal, but questing beast just ends the game so quickly. And they have zero in hand. The reason we have to deal damage to Chandra is because she has the minus to deal four. That would kill our poor questing beast. We don't want that. Looks like I go for the other mana efficient play of Experiment 1 plus Hasted Spellbreaker. Again, it's Chandra because I don't want them to get free removal. So I think Questing Beast would have been pretty strong here and it would have pressured their life total, which is like almost guaranteed lethal next turn if it lives. So this line might have been a little bit too fancy, but. It's also somewhat suspicious to the opponent. Why not take out the Gideon? Well, I don't want my creature to die. So we go with Chandra so that she doesn't have her minus available, which might be less of an issue if it's not Questing Beast. I feel like Girl Spellbreaker could even just go face. Our play is becoming inaccurate here at the end of the game. Opponent misses on their Chandra plus because they hit a land. That's another good thing is Gideon becomes, or they use their plus thinking it might actually work. I mean, there's not really much else they can do. But I know if I have this questing beast and I put it in play, then my girl spellbreaker can still deal damage. Whatever card our opponent drew. I guess it wasn't an untapped land and it wasn't a spell that affects the board because of course they can't play anything during our turn because of Fires of Invention. And so since I just get my mana back anyway, I can play Burning Tree Emissary before Questing Beast. And then I get to swing for lethal at my opponent because girl spellbreakers damage would not be prevented i have a big experiment one and then questing beast is going to kill their gideon so we were able to maneuver this game to take great advantage of questing beast in neutralizing gideon's prevent damage as well as the cost of gideon always giving the opponent extra effective life total because if you have to kill Gideon that's damage that's not going to their face both quest and beast of course you can do both and of course it is very important I target the correct planeswalker here otherwise they will not lose the game at negative two but we do awesome hopefully you enjoyed that interesting rules interaction seeing the aggressive power of something like gruel having haste creatures out of everywhere is extremely powerful your opponent never knows if their planeswalkers or their life total are safe